Well, it's time to get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Hanewald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse. And we have Brad Rathgever, Head of School at One Schoolhouse here with us today. Brad, you want to say hello to everybody before I begin the inquisition? <laughs> sure. Hi, everybody. Looking forward to answering your questions and talking about this topic um, and doing a little bit of uh, future looking today. Um, I know that we have spent so much time <laughs> in the moment these days uh, that hopefully this half hour gives you a time, gives you a chance to start to think and perhaps even dream a little bit about um, what might be to come. That sounds great. And I'm just going to remind everybody, use the chat to share any resources that you have and greet your fellow participants. And we're going to use the Q&A for questions. So, Brad, as you and I prepared for this webinar, thinking about the topic, online learning is here to say, you were telling me that there's really two ways to look at this. And I was wondering if that would be a good place to start and you could explain that. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think I mean, there's probably more than two ways, but the kind of two ways that I think about this <laughs> from, my, from where I said are, there's kind of the micro perspective and the macro perspective. Um, there's the micro perspective in that classes will be different in the future because of this moment in time, right? We, we know that teachers has, have been uptrained uh, in tenants of distance learning, perhaps some tenants of online learning to the point where their classrooms are not gonna look the same moving forward. The ways that they use the learning management system, the ways that they um, use different technology tools, the way they even think and organize their classes and hopefully their pedagogy has changed to be a bit more competency driven. So that's the micro perspective. On the macro side though, school itself is going to be different in the future. Online learning will be a component of what every school does in the future. We're not just gonna ditch this, or at least the schools that are gonna be forward thinking and come out of this crisis um, in really good shape are the ones who are gonna figure out how do I retain some of the pieces of online learning moving forward so that we can be uh, a school that meets our mission uh, more fully um, in, our, in our next iteration. Yeah, so that's really interesting. And you've been in this space for longer than just about anybody in independent school, you know, working in online learning. And so I can imagine that in the past, you've said online learning is here to stay. So can you talk a little bit about the background, what's different now, some trajectories you're seeing? Absolutely, Sarah. Yeah, I've been saying for years that the online learning is here to stay. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the data has told us that for years and years and years. The data has told us that, um, that online learning is becoming more and more a part of what institutions do. It's been particularly clear at the college level because there has been better polling and data available at the college level than there has at the K-12 level. And if you look at the data out of colleges, what you see is an uptick every year of typically between two and four percentage points of the number of students who say that they are taking an online class in a given semester. So this is data that um, we'll find the link and perhaps and put it in uh, the last week at one schoolhouse um, uh, mailing that will come out on Sunday of this week that shows that we've gone from about 23, 23, 4% of students uh, taking a class online in any given semester seven, eight, nine years ago. So now it's north, well, last year, let's say it was north of 38%, which means overall more than 75% of kids were having an online experience as part of their college experience. What that kind of tells us at the collegiate level is that colleges have understood for years that it's not enough to simply have a wonderful and vibrant campus and community in Chapel Hill or Berkeley or Cambridge that we have to be thinking more in a global sense and more in a sense of connecting our communities in online spaces as well. So it's not that we're eschewing place-based learning. In fact, often we're cherishing the place-based learning that we can do. We also though recognize in this day and age that it's not simply enough um, to be able to create the type of interconnected communities and to meet our missions uh, in, in the way we possibly can these days. So if we look at that from the college perspective, that is absolutely trickled on in to K-12 
uh, learning, particularly independent schools, particularly independent high schools, um, over the last 10 years as well. I can show that just in our enrollment numbers at one schoolhouse, right? You know, in the year pre-pandemic, we increased our enrollment 30%. You know, that's a big jump in one year pre-pandemic. Right. Then you get into pandemic years and you start to just shoot up. So it's not that um, people were long, wrong, you know, years ago saying online learning is here to stay. They were right. It's just that the curve has gone from like this to like this in the last, um, in the last, uh, in the last couple months. Yeah. And, um, well, so we'll get to this a little bit more in a minute, but if I'm an academic leader at a school and I'm looking at, you know, okay, what, what do I need to be considering looking in the future? Because we're not going to be, we are going to be post pandemic, right? <laughs> so this is, this is where we are now. And I think in pandemic is lasting longer than than some of us anticipated, but yeah. we are going to be post pandemic. But what do I need to be at least watching right now if I'm in a brick and mortar school to think about that post pandemic part? Yeah. Yeah. And so let's not forget, let's take a pause back and, and think about what we typically do too during October and November and December in schools, right? In, in a typical school year in October, November, and December, uh, you all know as academic leaders in schools that. Once we've kind of started this year and it's off to a good start, we immediately start to think about next year and future thinking. We do a lot of strategic planning work in October, November, and December in independent schools, right? Like this is the time where we're starting to plot out. This is what we want to be and where we want to be going into next year. So we're thinking about what our curriculum guides are. We're thinking about what programs we might be starting. We might be doing building planning. We might be doing, you know, any of those kind of things happen typically in an independent school at this time of year. I'd strongly suggest to school leaders that you need to still set aside some of this time, as difficult as it may be, to be thinking about where you want to be going. To me, the smart school, again, is not trying to get back to normal. The smart school right now is trying to figure out what can we learn from the last six, seven months? What types of skills and competencies do our teachers have, do our students have? that we can carry forward in our work moving forward. I think that there is also um, an opportunity for schools at this moment to think about their finances a little bit differently, to think about how they're, how they're approaching um, funding different programs that they have on campus differently. I think that there is a moment here to be thinking about, um, uh, uh, to be thinking more broadly around how our school can meet its mission through very different types of programs. I, I'm thinking, Sarah, uh, I'm kind of drawing together two in my mind and play with me here for a second and feel free to jump in with questions. I'm playing in my mind kind of like a current trend that we have of families setting up pods for learning, right? That's happening all across the country right now. Mm -hmm. And a trend that we saw for the couple of years pre-pandemic and that's micro schools being set up. Um, there are a couple independent schools that have set up micro schools. I think many of you know about those schools that have set up. There seems to me to be kind of an intersection there that might be really interesting for schools to explore, especially if they're exploring it in a way that embraces the opportunities that online learning can provide, right? When you're on a campus, it's really difficult. If you're, if you're trying to run a micro school, a really small school, it's really difficult to have an extraordinary breadth of elective opportunities. It's extraordinarily difficult to have multiple languages that you're offering. It's extraordinarily difficult to have upper level uh, computer science or math classes. Um, but if you think about, you know, what is the core of the program that we wanna be delivering perhaps in person? And then you think about, well, how can we then, you know, connect students across campuses online or connect to some consortium of schools online? Then you can start to create a full on academic program um, in one of those kind of pod micro school type things going on. So that's, that's kind of like big picture, long out strategy things. It is. Yeah. But I think what you're getting at is, you know, those conversations, and this is the time of year for it. What have we always wanted to do? Yeah. You know, what yeah. are some yeah, you wish we could do that? Thank you. You simplified that beautifully, Sarah. What have, we, what have we always wanted to do? Yeah. Well, and I'm thinking too about the intense place-based study. And uh, one of the things that one of the schools that I've been at that I just still really 
think about really strongly is this opportunity to go for a semester and immerse yourself in place-based learning and how hard that was for certain students to do based on their academic ambitions or family expectations. And I think online learning is a chance to say, oh, you know what, we can, we can have both. We can have some continuity of this program that meets the specific need of the student that aligns with this, this desire to be immersed in another place at the same time. I, yeah, and, and I think we've all recognized that one thing that online learning can allow us to do is think about time and space differently moving forward, right? Uh, which allows us perhaps to be even more centered in our places, right? Yeah. There are limitations, time limitations of the amount of time you get the kids on campus. And there are real things that you want them to be doing with that space that they are in and with that cohort that they are in on campus. If you have some flexibility because you've, if, because you've put some online pieces into your program that that make it so that the school day doesn't all have to be compressed or academic day doesn't have to all be compressed between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. Well, gosh, you've opened up a huge range of opportunities for kids um, to, uh, to, to really engage deeply in the community and in the place that they're in. You know what, I'm gonna take the words that you used at the beginning, macro and micro, and in a completely different way, right? How are we thinking about the school day minute by minute and how are we thinking about a child's four-year experience in high school? You know, and I know that there are K-8 implications too, or 3-8, but think about high school there. Yeah, this is the opportunity to reprioritize community time, right? To reprioritize, uh, to reprioritize again, the, the places that we might have on our campuses. It, it's a really great opportunity. People realized, during this crisis that the schedule wasn't as sacrosanct as they thought it was. They realized that their school calendar wasn't as sacrosanct as they thought that it was, yeah. right? So let's blow some of these things up and really get down to what's meaningful to be done together and on campus when we are able to come back to campus. Right, what really is sacrosanct, right? And, and it's yeah. that when we're actually connecting with each other, we're not checking off some boxes. You know, and how different that is. Um, so, so what are some questions? And I want to open this up too for Q and A. If y'all want to put some questions in the question and answers, but what are some questions? You know, we said the what are you always wanting to do? But are there things that you think you have to do that you don't really want to do? And maybe is a time to to really shed some things, Brad. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, this kind of gets into the financial question. So, uh, what I've as you heard me kind of talk about, I've, I've talked about like trend lines accelerating, not that they didn't exist before. So we have seen a number of trend lines accelerate over the last year. Um, again, even pre-pandemic though, we saw that some of these things really accelerate. Um, one is schools are thinking really carefully about the languages that they're offering on campus. Um, they are, uh, we're seeing a number of schools move languages online to us not just to replace an existing language that, that, that's offered on campus, but actually often to add additional languages beyond what they have the capability of doing. So schools are seeing, you know, if you move a language online that's a small enrollment language, you can often not just move that online, uh, but then add on that additional language. So very typical for schools recently to be adding or to be moving their Latin programs online. But when they move their Latin program online, they'll also go back to their community and say, okay, Latin's going online, but we're also going to start to offer Mandarin and Chinese online. And we're going to also start to offer American Sign Language online. So, uh, so the community can see the wins behind that type of move. Mm -hmm. We've been seeing this for years also in like small enrollment, upper level math classes, especially specialized computer science courses, elective opportunities, um, places where it's really difficult to do the staffing and often where it's difficult to do the scheduling and calendaring for kids too. So those yeah. are some of the kind of trends that I can see just accelerating at a crazy rate over the next uh, couple of years and something that school leaders and academic leaders should be thinking about right now um, because of the budgetary implications and because y'all are putting together curriculum guides right now where you're starting to think about what your curriculum guides are going to look like. 
Um, so making those moves, having those conversations now is really important. I know that some schools are in a better financial position coming out of the pandemic and other schools are in a much worse financial position coming out of the pandemic. There have been many schools that have looked at some of the changes that I was just referencing as cost saving measures um, that make sense for their institution uh, short and long term. Oftentimes they time that with key staff retirements um, if they have the ability to do that. Um, although I, I understand that some schools won't be in that kind of um, position this year. You know, something that you and I talked about when we were planning for this as well mm -hmm. is that idea of what's your criteria when you're making decisions about what to say goodbye to. And you touched on this and I wanna add a little bit more, which is that sometimes we do things really well. And so we think, well, we've gotta keep doing it because this is beloved, <laughs> and do it well. But that's not always the only criteria, right? You know, sometimes it's the cost for doing this really well and thinking about, uh, you use this word and I want you to elaborate on it, impact, right? Yeah. You do it really, really well. And I've got an example from a school that I'm not gonna name, but there was a school that had an incredible um, floral arrangement budget and every meeting had fresh flowers in the center of the table. It's like, wow, every time you come in here, it feels really good and it looks good and we were really happy to be here, but you know, how is that your student program? And it's something that had just crept. Yeah, you know, Sarah, I, I think that the metric that a lot of independent schools have used in the past is, is this program working? Is it good? And I'm not sure that that's good enough anymore. I'm not sure that that's the right metric that we should be looking at to determine whether a program, whether a flower arrangement budget, what, whether whatever it might be, um, should be continued in a post-pandemic world. I think that we are learning in this pandemic time, again, that um, some of the things that we held as sacrosanct don't necessarily have to be. So we have a chance to change the metrics coming out. I think you're right, Sarah, it's really about the impact that that program is having or that impact that that part of the budget is having on your mission first and foremost, and then the outcomes that you are trying to achieve. This is where I think that kind of critical look at everything from classes that we're offering to extracurriculars that we have to sports programs that we're offering, schools are gonna be taking a much more critical look at in order to determine the impact and the impact towards the mission and the type of experiences that we're trying to create. And I will say, I deliberately picked something that was a little bit fluffy because I wanna be really careful. You just did something much braver than me, which you named specifics. Um, so that's great. We've got a couple of questions coming in. I'm gonna direct at you while I dodge my floor question from there. It was, it was gonna blow somebody up somewhere. Um, so we've got the question, it says, you talked about limited enrollment courses like advanced math or unusual languages that are hard to staff and schedule. How does moving those online make them easier to staff and schedule? Yeah, so limited enrollment classes. So the assumption there is that you're probably not using your own teachers to teach them online, or, or maybe you are. Um, so if you're doing limited enrollment classes, more likely you're not having your own teachers teach those kids online. Instead, you're working with a consortium or you're working you know, with a for-profit provider or something like that in order to have those classes move to the online space, which if they're online and asynchronous means that they don't have to be scheduled in the exact block that that class would have been. If they're online and, and if they are online and synchronous, then you have much less flexibility around um, scheduling and it doesn't solve that problem. But this is where kind of, again, we've just seen, and I'll just share with us, share with you all our lived experience at one schoolhouse. We've just seen more and more schools move their programs uh, in some of these specialized areas to us online to allow both to solve the staffing issue and to solve the scheduling issue. Yep. And there's a third issue that those really address well, which is some of the kids, let's take the advanced math example, they are used to being younger than their classmates through all these years and probably the smartest kid in the room over and over again. 
And that's really great for those kids to meet people who can, to, for want of a better expression, give them a run for their money before they get to college. <laughs> I got to say, Sarah, back in the early years of the online school for girls, we recognized that really early on that when one of our first classes we ran was multivariable calculus and differential equations. Um, and the girls loved it because they were used to being the one or two kids who were juniors in AP, BC, Calc, right? Um, and now all of a sudden they're in a peer group of all these other incredibly bright math students who um, are really kind of getting into a class online and saying, I've met my peers. Mm -hmm. I, I remember in, in our second year, we had 22 or so uh, kids in that multivariable calculus differential equations class. And in addition to that, six of them were going to Princeton the next year. And so they got to know each other through this class. And even though one was in Nashville and one was in Connecticut and you know all across the country, they had already developed a peer group so that when they went to college together, they already knew some people. It was really kind of cool and fun and just sure showed us really early on the power of putting um, true high school peers together into classes um, and giving these kids an opportunity um, to, to, to meet and develop community um, beyond what was just available to them on their own campus. So I just want to remind everybody to put the questions in the Q&A. If you put them in the chat, just to panelists, it comes to me and Brad, but I might miss it. So put it in the Q&A, but Brad, this is a question we've got. Um, so is there anything academic leaders should look out for if they're thinking about planning in these new ways? Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. There's a lot you should look out for. <laughs> um, what keeps you up? <laughs> well, I, I was going to focus this actually, I think Sarah towards, um, there's a lot of experimentation out there right now, which is awesome. And I think that we should be really excited about the ways that our faculties on our own campus and um, what we see throughout the community is, is how it's evolving and changing so rapidly. And at the same time, I think we have to ask ourselves a really serious question about how do we know that it's any good? How do we know that it's really quality? How do we know that this is making an impact, that this is making a difference, and that it's actually doing good things for kids? So I think that one of the challenges that schools, um, we hope that schools are thinking more and more about is how they're assessing the programs that they have this year and making sure that kids are meeting the competencies that we expect them to meet within their courses. Yeah. Faculty evaluation looks different. These are things, topics we've been talking a lot about this, this fall, right? Like faculty evaluation looks different. Mm -hmm. You've got to be polling students regularly and you've got to be collecting those poll responses centrally. You can't just have your teachers collect poll responses. Right. This is our topic from a couple of weeks ago that we talked about a lot. And we're just not seeing schools put in um, the structures that are going to help them know whether it's any good yet. And I, we see this kind of in our weekly poll surveys. Sarah, you may have this at your fingertips faster than I can here. Um, but we see this in our weekly pulse surveys when we've been asking schools, have you been um, uh, evaluating faculty? Have you been pulling in this data about students' lived experiences? Have you been doing some of these things? And we're just not seeing many schools take the time to assess quality. So if I was sitting in a face-to-face -face school right now, I would really concentrate on that issue. How do I know that this is any good? Because it's not that you're going to want to bring every innovation forward into next year too, right? There are things we absolutely want to bring into the future years. There are things we should ditch after this year too. Right. And you're going to have to figure that out. And you're going to have to also make that case because there's going to be some teachers on your campus that are probably going to be saying to you, but I really liked doing this. And this was great that this worked, but you don't know that it worked. You don't know that it worked. And I think um, when you do know, there, the, the part B of that is, does everybody else know, right? What do you, um, 
what are you communicating out about what's working and demonstrating and making sure you and I wrote an article with some of our other colleagues about communicating your value? Yeah. If you're doing something really great, but nobody knows, then, and then you're having to counter that message too. I mean, what are people seeing in the local media about online learning based on what journalists are writing you know, focusing on different issues in your community. And I know that that varies tremendously from place to place. Yeah, Sarah, I'll, I'll go back to this. I'm sorry that I'm kind of keeping going back to some of the early years of being in online learning, but but this was a lesson that I learned, I think, in day four um, of, of my job. And that was uh, when you're working online, you are constantly challenged to know whether your program is any good. Right. You all have to be able to tell your parents if part of your program is online this year, how you know it is any good. And so a lot of that gets into assessing yourselves, right? Assessing and, and collecting data and understanding um, and understanding all of that. But you got to be able to tell that story too. Yeah. Right. I, I could go to any school. I, I used to, I used to do a lot of faculty presentations at schools um, and invariably, inevitably at, at some point, uh, a faculty member in the back of the auditorium would raise their hand and say, this all sounds nice and well enough, but, but how is your program any good? Right? And they thought that it was the ultimate gotcha question because the assumption was that, you know, what we do here at X school, it is good because it's what we do here at X school, right? And so I had to have a whole narrative about this is how I know that the program that we have is any good. Um, and, uh, and I knew that it was a compelling narrative, right? Like it started with, this is how we train our faculty members. This is the type of coaching that they get as they go along. They are evaluated four times a year. They get constant coaching and feedback as they go along. The students are surveyed a number of times a year. I could tick off all of those different things and give them exact data points to show how I knew that the online program that we had was any good. I think you all are challenged to do that right now, particularly by your parents who are being inundated with news stories that are saying this hybrid learning thing isn't working or online learning isn't working or whatever it might be. Um, you need to counteract that narrative. Yep. So I've got a couple of stats to share, but I, I think too, schools are used to communicating how things are working on the single student level, right? Through really insightful, thoughtful comments. You don't want to stop doing that. You don't want to stop telling a parent your child is succeeding because, and here's how your child is succeeding. But that whole program level, you just can't overlook that. And I've got a question that I want to ask here, which is, um, is there a consensus about the skills and opportunities the student experience of online learning offers better than in person? And so I guess that's a challenging frame because it's better than in person and maybe some of the times maybe it's different or part of a complete experience. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're all learning in this moment is that there are things that are, uh, there are educational experiences that are better in person than they are online. And that there are educational experiences that are better online than there are than they are in person. I think that everybody kind of in face-to-face -face independent schools knew that first part pre-pandemic, but is now learning that second part. Mm -hmm. So I'll just name a couple of those things. Um, one is that the online learning space is, uh, is better for deeper discussions often because it invites in voices that sometimes feel, um, feel not able to express themselves fully in the face-to-face -face classroom. In particular, introverts just shine in the online classroom in a way that's really difficult for them to shine in the in-person classroom. Um, some of you have heard me tell this story before too. Uh, again, this is kind of an early learning that we had where I walked into an upper school director's office at a school in Tennessee and was raving about this awesome student in a genetics class. And the upper school director said to me, you can't be talking about that child. You gotta be talking about somebody else because that kid never says anything in the class. I said, no, look, look, here's the discussions that they're having. She is the class leader. 
what we realized is that she had never had an opportunity to share her voice in the same way in her face-to-face -face classrooms. And now in this online learning space, she had a spot to shine. She could think about her answers before she shared them. She could share them when she was ready to share them. And she really was the class leader. So then it became kind of, okay, how can we work with this student in order to bring that same presence online to that face-to-face -face classroom experience, right? And so then it became this awesome, um, awesome dialogue that we were having with the school about how we can help the student shine in different ways. So that's, that's just one of those ways that we know and we don't want to lose going forward. Right, and I think that speaks to that developmentally appropriate response to like when I added, I'm going to go back to the olden days, first class discussion bulletin boards <laughs> into the English class. And I just knew that that wasn't something I was ever going to let go of because of the groundwork those online discussions laid for the in-person classes. And I've got some interesting stats here. I want to address one of the things that you challenged us all in the beginning um, or in the mid, but 63% of the respondents to our poll have not yet surveyed students globally about what's going on, you know, how they're doing, how they're using time, social, emotional side, like there's all kinds of questions. And I think the exact right questions to ask are, are place specific, right? Depending on your school and your program and the age of your students and how things what are going. What do you value, right? It depends on what you value, right? I, I'd say almost every independent school is probably asking, you know, how connected do you feel to your teacher on a seven point scale or something like that, right? Because you want to make sure that that's there. But, but there are things that each individual community values and you should be assessing and monitoring whether you're actually hitting those things. And then something else we ask schools to, oh, we are about out of time. So I'm going to let you go. But we did ask schools, you know, are you tracking this? Are you paying attention to the changes that you're making? Because you and I know that if you don't stop every now and then and channel a little Ferris Bueller, look around and see what's going on right now, you won't remember when you get to May and the school year is ending. You're going to remember those adjustments you made in October and exactly why you did them and extract the, the impact that you want to carry forward. Yep. Absolutely. That's the archivist thing. We, we were encouraging schools to have somebody designated as your archivists, somebody who is noting what changes you're making as the year goes along. So you have that, that good history of it. And I just want to do a quick shout out to Emily. Thank you for saying yes to evaluating and assessing and sharing with faculty and keeping track of all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Brad, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. I pulling out your uh, crystal globe a little bit, looking into the future. Happy to do so. And it's, it's always great to connect with academic leaders around the country. Everybody have a good rest of the week.